we're just yeah, we're just gonna go right into the um, worship service. Thank you all that came out yesterday. You guys were tremendous. We got a lot done. And this is the first time I've seen over 13, maybe there was about 15 when Miss Leola, yes, and Miss Sydney showed up. Uh, we, we moved over to like the 15. Uh, there were so many people, John didn't know where to put them all. Amen. That's a good problem, people. Amen. Once a month, beautification, this was the best. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. Oh, yeah, I had Ann out there uh, directing traffic. I love you, you know that. <laughs> I'll get a when I come out. Amen, amen. Yeah. You're going to figure that out. We're, we're going to go ahead and uh, meta narrative. Meta narrative. That's a crazy word. Uh, it's, it's probably like, what is this pastor doing? Listen, hang in there with me. Please, in the name of Jesus Christ, hang in in there with me. Today's sermon is going to be touching on some historical facts that's going to throw you off, and that's not my intention. But in order to lay a foundation, it's going to be difficult to try and figure out the direction that we're going. So please bear with me in the very beginning what I'm going to do is pray so that God can give us the patience and the ability to tolerate historical information and that we can get an understanding of where we're going with this series, which is part three today of the Big Picture series. So we have three more. I promise you, you will be blessed. You're just going to have to like get through the turbulence as we climb and there's going to be a lot of turbulence today in the beginning but once we get to our you know cruising altitude we're going to be all right so let's pray in the name of jesus christ lord there is no other name under heaven by which we might be saved and you have done a tremendous work in bringing us together into the fold and calling us children of god we worship you lord we love you and we praise you Lord, we confess that you are holy, righteous, sanctified. There is none like our God. And we thank you. As we attempt, Lord God, to dive into this sermon, that, Lord, I know you've given us this to study and to read and to understand for a purpose. I pray that that purpose will be fulfilled. And I pray, Lord God, that as we go through the beginning stages of this particular sermon, you would give us, Lord, the endurance and the patience and the wisdom and the understanding, Lord, regarding these issues. We're going to give you all honor, glory, and praise in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, the first thing that I want to say is to, uh, in laying the foundation uh, is that uh, we were talking yesterday, I'm going to try to do this real brief. We were talking yesterday, um, Shirley, myself, and Alice, while we were eating breakfast, and we were talking about the dynamics of society as things changed. When we were more... Uh, uh, of people living off the land, ranches and farms. There was more interaction, there was more communication, there was more intimacy between a father and his children, especially a father and his sons. Because the father got you up early and said, we're hitting the field. And there was not only a training of how to live off the land, but interactions about what that son liked, what he didn't, what that dad liked, what he didn't, and conversations about what was the interest of this son of mine. And all of that stuff started happening. But as the Industrial Revolution took off and the cities began to emerge, something 
changed. The father wasn't there at five o'clock in the morning to wake up the son and spend the day shoulder to shoulder having conversation and working together. The father went to work at five o'clock in the morning to get into those long cities to make some income to take care of his family. And by the time he got home, it was late in the evening and he just wants to relax, give me my newspaper, give me my dinner, son, I'll deal with you this weekend and we'll talk about that. It changed. Now, when you take a man or a woman that comes out of that era, and now they have children, and it's 30 years later, the children don't understand all of that. They only understand the industrial impact. Going to these large schools and seeing daddy leave and mommy raising me. And mommy saying, wait till your daddy gets home. <clears throat> when you try to tell that child how it was in the day, that child, that adult child, whatever it is, you know what they say? Man, that was the old days. I hear you, dad. I hear you. They don't want to hear that. Why am I saying all of this? Because that which was has impacted that which is. And when we lose sight of yesterday, tomorrow's fuzzy, and we live today differently, and when you try to tell me <clears throat> something and you try to pour into me your values, I don't understand your values. I don't remember sitting down reading a Bible to learn how to read. I play video games. And really, Dad, right now, you're just messing with my time. So are you done? I just want to go play some video games. It's changed. And that's what we're talking about today. The era that we find ourselves in today is considered a postmodern era. Postmodernity. And we need to embrace this. Why? What does this mean to us? What does modernism, what does modernity even mean? Why, why do I need to understand that? Lower me just a little bit, Andrew. Modernity is a historical period in the modern world with social and cultural norms, very important. And they had an impact on the Western culture. I'm gonna clarify that in a second. The things that changed in postmodern times, and we'll get into dates and all that real quick and then we'll breeze through and get to the word. But I gotta lay this. The things that changed and the things that were different were attitudes, norms, values, and practices, how you did life. And all of this stuff came out of a period called the Renaissance period. There were some major, major changes in the Renaissance period. It's considered in history the age of reason, the age of reason. And it went from the 17th century to the 18th century, which is considered the Enlightenment period. It's history. Now, there's a lot of historians that say that the period of modernity, the period of modernization, went into the 20th century. And it ended around the 1930s. That's where modernity began to take a shift. And the, the post, the after the modern period kicks in, which is us. That's where we're living today. 
It was right around World War II, which was from 1939 to 45. So all of this is happening, and then it goes into the 1980s and the 1990s, and now here we are. And this is considered post-modernity, or the post-modern era. That's where we live today. It was in these periods that the worldview of God was challenged. This is a sad period for the Christian church because things started changing the way we see God and the way we see his worldview. And now it's totally different in society. You know that when this nation was established, we were established as one nation under God. Postmodernity changed that. We were no longer one nation under God. We are one nation under gods. All religions. And it was always meant for freedom of religion. But this nation was founded on Christianity or Christian principles. We are a Judeo-Christian society. At least we were. At least we were. Today, if you say Merry Christmas, you might get fired if you work for the government. It's starting to change now, but that's what postmodernity has done. Now, it was in these periods that God's worldview was thrown out, and scholars began to challenge the importance and the treasures of the reformers. We got to keep this in the, in the uh, depths of our heart because in the period of the reformers, the motto was back to the sources. We need to go back to the literature. We need to stop translating the Bible from the Latin. And we need to go back to the Hebrew. And we need to go back to the Greek and the Aramaic. We need to see what the author was saying, not what our modern civilization is saying. What was the author saying? And does that change because of culture? If you talk to most modern Christians that are not really deeply rooted into what I'm talking about, they will argue the scriptures and say, that was then, this is now. The scriptures don't change. God doesn't change. His word stands forever. And if you believe in a God that is all-knowing, don't think that this postmodern era caught him by surprise. He, he says, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm beginning and end. I know everything. Amen. And what I've given to you will stand forever because I change not. I am immutable. Yeah. I will never change. But your culture will. And where once the church was able to turn the society right side up, now culture is turning us as a church upside down because the poison of our postmodern values and norms have seeped in. And now when you preach like this, you offend people. I'm really good at offending because I'm going by what the word is saying and I put a block on this may be a problem for this person. This, I don't think that way. I'm just preaching. And Lord, you just settle and you, you, you do your thing. But look, reformers like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Tyndale, Bullinger, Latimer, Booser, Melancotton, Rogers, and on and on and on. Men who died 
for their faith. Men who were burned and said, do you have anything to say? Will you repent? And they would say, I pray God forgives you and that he enlightens you. And they die in the fire. We keep thinking our history is the Apostle James and Paul, and that was our beginning, and we need them, and those, we are of the teachings of the Apostles. But from generation to generation to generation, as the traditions of the Apostles kept being poured out, we gained a lot of men and women in the faith that secured our salvation. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You say, no, it was God. No, it was God partnering with humanity that he redeemed. And those folks have a lot to do with you sitting in church on a Sunday morning in Tampa, Florida. And that happened in Europe. Don't forget that. You see, when the reformers came with all of their stuff, the gospel was too hard to swallow. It was too hard. And so, in the postmodern era, they began to say things like, we don't need all of that Greek and Hebrew. Here's the deal with Christianity. And they started setting standards for Christianity, lowering the bar of what God illuminated in the hearts of the reformers. In other words, they diluted the gospel. They turned the gospel into tainted Kool-Aid and had people drink it. And there was a whole lot of killing the human spirit and the soul because of the nonsense that was being taught. Now I'm going to move on. There's a guy that his name is Karl Barth. <clears throat> I don't like Karl Barth's theology. I don't. There's a lot about him. He's a universalist. There's a lot of stuff I don't agree with. But he was the first guy to challenge this postmodern teaching of the gospel and went against his teachers. If you want to read a good book from, from Karl Barth, buy the book of Romans. Is that a commentary? He, it is a commentary on the book of Romans by Karl Barth. And you will see, if you understand any history of the church, You'll see the contradictions of what the postmodern era was teaching, and Barth was saying, no, nah, man, that's not true. This is what Paul said. And so he was the first one in this new revitalization of the gospel. But there's a lot to Barth that I don't agree with. But I see him as a pillar in the movement that we see today, even though we're a minority, we're a minority. We are not a majority. We are a minority. We have to be careful, even in the minority status, in what we preach, how we preach it, how long we preach it. All of those things matter today in this postmodern era. Now, the person who's considered a founding father of postmodernism is a French philosopher by the name of Jean 
Francois Leotard. Now he's important. Now to you, you're gonna be like, come on, man, move on. He's important. He's important. That's how you spell his name if you want to Google him. And I would if I were you. He made this negative statement. This, that's a negative statement against God's worldview, against God's greater picture. He was against. There's a greater picture. God has a worldview. There's something out there that God gave us. And we must live our life based on the standards of God's view. That's not what he said. You see, last week we talked about truth claims. Your truth claim and my truth claim and Ms. B's truth claim can differ. The only truth claim that matters is God's. But we all have a truth claim. And you just got to listen to last week's sermon because all of these sermons are sequential. You'll miss if you don't catch it. That's not to boost me up. Oh, so many views. I don't care about that. If you want to understand what God is telling this church, you got to stay on the sermons. Because this particular sermon series is sequential. This one depends on last week, and I don't have time to break it down. But whenever you have a difference in truth claims, you have conflict. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what began to happen. Listen to what Leotard said. He said, simplifying to the extreme. This is a book he wrote in 79. Okay, remember, now we're talking postmodernism. This is a book he wrote. Simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern. Now stop, man. Please, get this. I am going to tell you what the postmodern era means. That's what he's saying. You want to know where we're at? We're in the postmodern era. We left the Enlightenment period. We left modernization. Now we're postmodern. We're after the modern movement. And this is what it means to live today as a human being in this country or in the Western culture, because he was from, you know, he was French. He says, I define postmodern as incredulity toward the meta narrative. Man, that is it right there. I'm going to break it down because. The first time I heard this, I was like, what? Because this is language that we're not, you know, what are you talking about? That word, incredulity, look it up. It means a, an unwillingness or an inability to believe something. So in this case, it's an inability or an unwillingness to believe that there's a big picture or a meta narrative. In the postmodern era, when the term meta narrative was used, it was used to talk about the Christian viewpoint or God's view. Meta meaning the larger, narrative meaning story. So he's saying postmodernism is our, we don't want to deal with God. We don't want to deal with God's story. We have our own story. Leotard is saying that when the postmodern age came forth, the culture became unwilling and unable to believe that God had an overarching story by which our lives were to operate. He said, booey to that. It is a total rejection of any godly worldview. 
you don't believe me, look at society. That's where we're at. That's where the church of Jesus Christ finds itself. We don't have time to be confused about cultural norms that are truth claims that contradict this. For we are an inefficient and ineffective church, and all we are is a fellowship where we get together at the social club. That's not what God called us to be. Now, the way he says it's simplifying to the extreme. I'm going to simplify this to you to the extreme. Postmodernism is an incredulity. It is a scarfing. It is a what? You believe that fable? you got to be kidding me. You still believe in Christianity? The way the reformers taught us? you got to be kidding me because the reformers taught us the worldview of God. Now, the word meta-narrative, it has that pretext. I'm sorry, <laughs> pretext. Prefix in it, meta, which means beyond large. Beyond large. And it has that word narrative, meaning the story that is beyond large. It is God's story. So it describes a greater, it describes a larger story regarding the worldview. Christians, you should only have one worldview. What does Jesus say? That's your worldview. Oh, that's too strict. Well, welcome to the postmodern era. Because it's in your heart. There's only one worldview. What does God say about that? We were not evolved from some monkeys. What does God say about that? We don't believe in same-sex marriage. What does God say about that? You see, there's a whole lot to the meta-narrative. And sometimes when we kind of strain our values and our, and our cultural views, we're going to find traces of the world in what we embrace. You don't have to do anything with that. You can dismiss that. Actually, you can fast forward that if you ever do a study on this and say, let me get some of the notes from the back. You can fast forward that. That's just a personal opinion. So postmodern is a belittling <laughs> and a scarfing towards any sense that there's a larger story. There's no larger story. The postmodernist believes that any large story, any meta-narrative, get used to that word, today's title is, of the sermon, meta-narrative. Meta-narrative. They believe that any large story, any meta-narrative that pretends to give an explanation on anything especially regarding history and life, in an attempt to legitimize some version of truth, embracing some truth claim, should be rejected. It has an ill effect. People begin to believe that there's something more appealing about their script, not God's script. That's that pastor's opinion. That's not my opinion. That's that denomination's opinion. That's not my opinion. That's that church's opinion. That's not my opinion. As opposed to saying, is what that man of God's saying biblical? Because it don't matter who's preaching it. If it is biblical, it is biblical. So we have to strain our belief system and see what is it that brings me to this? Sometimes it's not a belief system. Sometimes it's just issues. I can't get over this issue about this particular character in this person that's giving me this information. I don't know. It could be anything. But we have to find it if we're going to be a biblical Christianity, what is it that's stopping me from my blessings? Amen. 
People that have their own meta narrative or have their own narrative, their own script, they want to write their own version of reality. They want to write their own version of truth, and it becomes their truth claim, and it clashes and conflicts with other truth claims that are now being presented to them. From a church perspective, it's coming from the pulpit in the classrooms and the small groups. Why do you think small groups need, uh, need coaching? Because a small group leader can be so comfortable in his little world or her little world that they forget about the overall vision and the meta-narrative that we're going by. And then there's conflict. They say, my story is better than God's story. It's going to bring me happiness. It's going to give me some significance. It's going to give me some fulfillment, contentment. Come on, I deserve that. Yeah. Right, but will it? So we're faced with some questions. Do we really believe that there is a meta-narrative? That's the primary question. Is there really God's view? Is this the denominational view or your view, Pastor? That's why since I've been preaching on this pulpit, I've been telling folks, don't believe me. And you can attest to that. Do not believe what I tell you. Go and study it for yourself. Have I not said that? Yeah. Over and over and over why? Because that's my value. This is not about me. Now, preaching style and some of the things I may discuss from the pulpit may be different than a preaching. I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about God's Word. So do we really believe that there's a meta-narrative? If you say yes, if there is a meta-narrative, is it good? Is the meta-narrative good, even though attached to the meta-narrative, you're going to find suffering, pain, rejection, hardship. You fill in the blank. You fill in the blank. See, these are the things that people want to change the meta-narrative because they don't want to deal with. Who wants suffering? I don't. I don't want any suffering. My script bypasses that. See, when God tells you to go share the gospel with someone, and you say, I don't feel like feeling rejected today. I share the gospel, they're going to laugh at me. They're going to lose respect for me. I'll bypass that. You just bypass a piece of the meta narrative that we're called to deliver the gospel. Now I don't want to deal with the shame. See, the apostle said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, for the Jew first and then the Gentile. That's why Paul put that in there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Amen? The 116, baby. So we have to come with that conclusion. These are the things we try to avoid. These are the things that we're going to write a script to bypass. We're going to go around these negatives. And we're going to disregard what Jesus Christ said to the church. In John chapter 16, verse 33, I'm reading from the message because it lays it out. He said, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I've conquered the world. 
See, the postmodern view appears to be a thing of the recent past. Oh, 17th century, and then bam, World War II, then postmodernism is going to kick in, you know, in the early 1900s or the 20th century. I got news for you. The postmodern attitude and spirit started in the heavens, not on the earth. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 through 14. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. By the way, when you think of north, what do you think? North. North. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Who said that? We call it the five I wills. The five I wills of the devil. That's the beginning of the postmodern view. It was to reject. It was to belittle. It was to scarf. At the meta narrative of God. I don't care what your script is. I'm going above that. Who's with me? <laughs> Lucifer was saying that he was not going to buy into any larger picture. He didn't care about any heavenly or divine story. That meant nothing to them or to him. He's saying, I'm writing my own script. That script that he's given me is not benefiting me. I want more. Human beings do this all the time. Human beings do this all the time. Let's look at what he said real brief. Go to the next. Yeah, I will ascend into heaven. So what was his desire? To occupy the third heaven. To penetrate the kingdom of God. That's the desire. Look at the second I will. I'm going to exalt, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What was Lucifer's desire? That's what you have to ask when you read the I wills. What's the desire behind this? Where's the sin? The desire was to rise up high than all other angelic beings. You see, he dreamed of ruling over all angels in the kingdom of God. And then he says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. What was his desire? To be enthroned in the highest place with all of the angels submitting to him. He wanted worship. Look at the next I will. This is the devil, man. He hasn't changed neither. I will ascend above the highest of the clouds. What was his desire? Glory. If you do a study on clouds in the scripture, even when Jesus ascended, clouds are involved. So it's, it, it's a symbol of what he's saying. I want glory. And then look at his last, I will. I will be like the Most High. What was his desire? He wanted to be equal to the maker and creator of all things. He wanted to replace God. He wanted to take the place of God. He wanted independence. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. I remember sitting in the pew, loving my pastor, but saying to myself, I would do it different. Well, you see, he does that, and that's cool, but I would do it like this. And I remember the Spirit speaking to me clearly. Get that out of your head. Focus. And when it's your turn, you do it your way. Submit. I didn't know I was going to be a pastor. I just had this thing in my heart that I would do it different. 
what you, but God forbid if I went to my pastor and said, what you doing? You doing this and you doing that. I don't know. No way. No way. You just have to wait to see what God's going to do in your life. And if you're called to be, I knew I was called to be a pastor. I just didn't want it. I ran from it. I really did. I ran. I was going to be an electrical engineer. I wanted big money. Because I wanted to make up for all of the damage I did to my family. But thank God I married a woman of God. She said, you're going to be miserable. Because you're disobeying God. God wants you with his people. Not with some electricians making a lot of money. I said, yeah, but this will make up for all the damage I did. She said, no, it's going to cause more damage. So I submitted, and here I am. So what did Lucifer want? Those five I will, he wanted position, he wanted rule, he wanted idolization, he wanted dazzling glory, and he wanted equality. Now if you take all of those letters together, you got pride. Let's go to the next slide. Position, rule, idolization, dazzling glory, equality. Pride, man. What did he get? Let me share with you what he got. Isaiah 14, 15. But you were brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. That's what he got. You know something? Jesus the Lord testifies to the day that that happened. Or it wasn't maybe, a day, I don't know, if it was in eternity or if it was after the creation, I don't know. He's not very clear about that. We just have speculation depending on your theology. So I'm going to leave that one alone. But look what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, where did this prideful, fallen creature, with his own script, his own story, where did he end up? He ended up in a fallen condition. People, listen to me, man. We think just because we're not sinning that we haven't sinned. You want to know when you're out of the will of God? You want to know when you're in trouble? Just look at the norm of your life. And when you see the differences that are not lining up with what it's supposed to look like, you know you're in trouble. You know you got to get that right. He was falling. What did he do with his script? What do we do with our script? Ah, uh, you did A, B, and C. God is dealing with you. What are you doing with your script? Because you still have that bad boy in your back pocket. I'm going to tell you what he did with his script. This old shoe, this fallen creature, passed his script on because he hates God and he hates everything good that God does and he hates everything that God made. I'm going to sell my script. Genesis chapter 1, verse, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He's selling his script. God already gave Adam a script. I love you. I provided for you. Don't eat of that tree. Everything else is a green light. And I will walk with you in the cool of the day. But don't you eat of that tree. On the day that you do, you die. That's his script. 
Satan selling another script. Did God really say, come on, Eve? <laughs> yeah, come on. You see, this devil, he was once the morning star. That's what his name means, Lucifer. And he fell, and now his name is changed. We don't call him Lucifer no more. We don't call him Morning Star. We call him Satan. We call him adversary. We call him opponent. That's what Satan means. He is the enemy. He's the enemy of God. Therefore, he's your enemy. He's the adversary of God's larger story. Therefore, he's going to help you write your own story. And he is the opponent of all of God's people, the church. He hates you with a passion. And he wants to see you split off. He wants to see your values take so much precedence that it doesn't matter where God led you or what God is doing with you. That don't matter. Here's your script now. This is some dangerous stuff, huh? He's not a friend, he's a foe. See, Adam was given the worldview of God. Adam was given the larger story, and he was to be a covering for his wife and teach her the larger story. Adam did teach God's meta narrative to Eve. She knew it, he even overemphasized it. He didn't just say, God said, don't eat. He said, God said, don't touch it. That was added because God didn't say that. But that's how important Adam thought it was. Don't even touch it. Satan comes along and he challenges the larger story. And he convinces Eve that he had a better story than God's story. Way better. And he told Eve, the reason God has given you this greater story is because his intention is to oppress you. It's to keep you low. Not just you, Eve, all humanity. That's his goal, to oppress you. And he convinced Eve, Eve, you can write your own story. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. That sounds like a change in the narrative. Woman, you're not going to die. Because God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes are going to be open. Hello? And you're going to be like God. You know good from evil. Come on, that's why you don't want you touching that. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He don't want your eyes open, but you can open them, Eve. Does that sound familiar? What's your story? What's your narrative? What lives have you bought into? What fantasies have taken over your life? How far has your story strayed from God's story? See, this is the real problem with the church of God throughout the globe. I think it has moved away from the meta-narrative. And it's done it for so long that we have learned and leaned on another story which originated in the garden. But we don't connect that because it's like the story I started with, with the industrialization, take that child now later on and explain to him what it was like and what the story's supposed to be. And he's saying, come on, I just wanna play video games. You, you done that? You know, what was, what was that talking to you about? Yeah, election, man, come on, let's just go on. Where were we? Nobody wanna hear it? It's the same thing with our meta narrative, man. We may be tapping into an old meta narrative that brings destruction, but we don't know because to us it's a new norm. 
You got to be really careful, people. We want to be like God many times. And that's the same attitude of the devil. And that's pride. So we would be wise to see the whole faith now to result, and then I'm praying. Here's a text that you've read a million times. Let this one hang on your mirror for a week. Because this one can set you free. You need to see it, and I need to see it every day this week. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. Clean that up. And God will take us through the turbulence and the bumps. And when we hit a wall, he'll show us how to get around that wall. Now, we're not done, but we're done today. So next week is part four. Don't miss it. Don't miss any of these messages. Try not to. And if you have to, because, you know, things happen. I, I got an emergency. I got to do this. And, and, and this is a commitment. That's fine. Go into our website. We pay money for that website every month. And pull down the message that you missed so that you don't lose the, uh, the order of the sermons, the sequential order of the sermons. They will liberate us if we take heed to these messages.